In today's video, we're going to discuss Chapter 6, Chemical Reactivity and Mechanisms. We're going to be looking at some of the laws of thermodynamics and how they affect reactions and discuss more of the different parameters behind some of these reactions. So to begin with, we'll talk about enthalpy. Enthalpy is the heat energy exchange between reactions and its surroundings. When we make or break bonds, we're going to have transfers of energy between the molecules. Uh, specifically, when we're breaking a bond, that's going to require the system to absorb energy. And the electrons must absorb the kinetic energy to overcome the stability of the bond. So in order to break a bond, we're going to have to have some sort of input of energy into the system. There's two different ways that we can break a bond. So the homolytic bond cleavage, right? If we have two atoms, X and Y, we have the electrons that are shared between those two atoms in the bond. And a homolytic cleavage, those electrons are going to be split between the two different atoms. So we'll end up with two atoms, each with one electron or radicals. In a heterolytic bond cleavage, we're going to have both electrons moving to one atom, and that will form a pair of ions. The bond dissociation energy, or the change in enthalpy, is going to be the corresponding energy required for a homolytic bond cleavage. And for specific atom pairs, we'll have a, a value for this. In an exothermic reaction, the energy gained by the bonds is going to exceed the energy needed to break the bonds. So this should happen spontaneously. The products are going to be more stable than the reactants in an exothermic reaction. In an endothermic reaction, we're going to have to have some energy input so the energy needed for breaking the bonds exceeds the stability gained by forming the product. And we'll see what this looks like on an energy diagram in a second. For each type of bond, we're going to have a, a different amount of energy that's required to break the bond. So, for example, in a hydrogen-hydrogen bond, that's 104 kilocals per mole, compared to um, something like a carbon iodide bond, shown here, only 56 kilocals per mole. So this bond is much easier to break than, for example, a hydrogen-hydrogen bond. This is what it looks like on an energy diagram. On the x-axis, we have the reaction coordinate. So this is the state of the reaction as it moves forward. And then on the y-axis, we have the enthalpy or the energy of the reaction. So in an exothermic reaction, we're going to have starting materials at a higher energy than the products. And we're going to have some sort of barrier to get through until we hit the transition state at the top. And then we have the products. So the change in energy between the starting material and the products is going to be the enthalpy. In an endothermic reaction, the starting material are going to be lower in energy than the products. So we'll have a positive enthalpy. In an exothermic reaction, we have a negative enthalpy. So the temperature of the surroundings is going to increase. The, en the reaction is releasing energy. In an enthalpy, sorry, in an endothermic reaction, we're going to have a positive enthalpy. And so the temperature of the surrounding is consumed. So the sign of the enthalpy is important. This is going to help us to determine if a reaction is exothermic or endothermic. And we can often use a energy diagram to display this. Using the table from a, a few slides previous, we can calculate the delta H change for a reaction. And we can do this by comparing the bond association energy of the bonds being broken compared to the bonds being formed. So depending on the stability of the bonds being broken relative to the bonds being formed, we're either going to have an exothermic or endothermic reaction. If we look at this reaction here, <clears throat> we're breaking a carbon-hydrogen bond, and we're forming a carbon-bromine bond. We're also breaking a bromine-bromine bond. So we can look at the bonds being formed and the bonds being broken, add up their total energies, and then from that calculate the delta H. Since, for, since the delta H for this specific reaction is negative, negative 63, the reaction is going to be exothermic. 
The second law of thermodynamics is the key to understanding why one chemical reaction has a tendency to occur, but another does not. A spontaneous change is going to be a change that has a tendency to occur without the need to be driven by external influences. So what are some examples of spontaneous physical and chemical changes that you might be aware of occurring around all the time? Uh, one example would be waterfall running down a hill or a lump of sugar dissolving in a cup of coffee. The state change between a solid, a liquid, and a gas. Heat flowing from one hot object to a col colder object. Iron rusting over time. A gas expanding if you increase the volume. These are all changes that are going to be considered spontaneous changes. Let's take a look at gas expanding. If we have gas trapped in a container and we open that container to increase the surface to increase the volume the gas is going to expand spontaneously this is also an example of entropy so how fast is a spontaneous change well <clears throat> let's look at rust for as an example a car is going to take a long time to rust maybe months or years if we look at an apple if you take a bite out of an apple and let it sit on your tabletop for half an hour, an hour, it's going to start to turn yellow. And that yellow is actually rust occurring within the apple. So the, the rate at which an event occurs does not have any influence on whether the change is spontaneous or not. Spontaneous just means that the event is going to happen either way without influence from the outside. The time is completely irrelevant to a spontaneous change. Let's take another look at a spontaneous change. Let's say we have a castle wall, right? All of the bricks are neatly ordered. And then there's some sort of battle and the castle is destroyed. So all the bricks are, are completely disordered. And then over time we rebuild the castle and get it to to nearly as ordered as it once was. When we look at the total change in entropy or the disorder for this entire process, what we're really looking at is the start to the finish. We don't really care about the intermediates that occur. So entropy is a measure of the disorder of a system and it's a state function, meaning that all that we care about is the beginning and the end. We're not really worried about the structure of any of the intermediates. So low entropy means that we have very little disorder, and high entropy means that we have greater disorder. The entropy of an isolated system is going to increase in the course of any spontaneous change. So we have to be aware of what a spontaneous change is in order to understand entropy. And the, this entropy measurement is going to be a measurement of the randomness or the disorder in the system. As the order increases, the entropy decreases. If the disorder increases, the entropy is going to increase as well. A positive change in entropy is going to be an increase in disorder, and a negative change in entropy is going to be a decrease in disorder. For a specific system, we can calculate this change of entropy by looking at the entropy of the final state and comparing it to the entropy of the initial state. If the final state is more disordered than the initial state, then our change in entropy is greater than zero. Let's look at the state change between a crystalline solid, a liquid, and a gas. A solid is going to be very ordered in its crystal structure. As we melt that solid to a liquid, there's going to be more disorder. The molecules are going to take up a larger amount of space, and there'll be less order within the molecules. As we change to a gas, we'll take up an even larger amount of volume and there will be more randomness or disorder to the state of the molecules. So going from a solid to a liquid to a gas is going to be an increase in entropy.
both exothermic and endothermic reactions, right, enthalpy, can occur spontaneously. So the enthalpy and entropy both must be considered when we're trying to predict if a specific reaction will recur. Consider why a gas will expand when we open up the container to increase the volume. The number of states the molecule is going to spread across with the increased volume is going to be increased. So since there's more potential states, we're going to have more disorder and we're going to have greater entropy. When we're comparing the entropy of our system to the surroundings, we can use this equation. This equation states that the total change in entropy of the universe is going to be equal to the change of entropy in the system and the change of the entropy in the surroundings. So for an irreversible spontaneous process, the change in entropy of the universe is greater than zero. So this will be irreversible, right? In order for us to get the water back up to the top of the waterfall, we would it would be a non-spontaneous process. We would have to fill a bucket up with that water and carry it up to the top. But the water flowing down the waterfall is going to be spontaneous and irreversible. For a reversible process, or not spontaneous process, the total change in the entropy is going to equal zero. The change in entropy of the universe is constantly increasing. And that leads to the inevitable heat death of the universe. With regards to organic chemistry, and specifically looking at our reactions, there's a few types of changes that entropy will directly relate to, um, specifically looking at a reaction uh, that involves breaking a bond. So let's take a reaction where we have A and B, bound, atoms A and B bound together by a bond. If we have one mole of reactants and we break that bond to form A and B, we're going to have two moles of products. So this would be an example of increasing the disorder. Another example is if we have a cyclic compound that becomes acyclic. The entropy and enthalpy can be related to each other um, with an, an additional vari of variable of temperature using this equation, where we have the total change in entropy is equal to the negative change in enthalpy divided by the temperature plus the entropy of the system. This leads us to the Gibbs free energy equation. If we multiply both sides by the temperature and this will, the relationship between the entropy and the enthalpy is summarized in the Gibbs free energy equation where we have the Gibbs free energy being equal to the entropy uh, and the change of the surroundings minus temperature times the entropy change in the system. So if we want to use this to help determine if a reaction will occur spont spontaneously, the delta G must be negative overall. If the reaction is spontaneous, then delta G must be negative because we're going from two molecules to one molecule. So this is a decrease in entropy. We're becoming more ordered. So this whole term must be negative. For the Gibbs free energy to, to be negative overall, the change in entropy must also be negative. So Basically, in summary, the entropy of the surroundings is increasing more than the entropy of the system is increasing. If a process has a negative delta G, then the process is spontaneous and it's exergonic. So this delta G is going to be the relationship for the free energy comparing the reactants to the products. We're plotting G here instead of the enthalpy. Since our reactants are higher in Gibbs free energy than the products, we have an exergonic reaction.
if the process has a Gibbs free energy that's positive, then the products will be higher in energy than the reactants. And this will be an endergonic reaction, and this will favor the reactants. So we would need a large energy input to, to get over this barrier to form the products. And this leads us into equilibrium. If an equilibrium will occur when we have A and B going to C and D in the reverse reaction. If we look at the equilibrium constant, which is going to be the concentration of the products divided by the concentration of the reactants, we can actually relate this equilibrium to the Gibbs free energy uh, using this reaction. And so overall, we've looked at the equilibrium constant, the Gibbs free energy, the entropy, and the enthalpy. These are all thermodynamic terms. They can only describe the relative stability of both the products and the reactants, and they don't have any determining factor on the rate. So recall that the sign of the delta G tells us if a process is going to be favored. So is the process spontaneous? Is it going to occur? But what it doesn't tell us anything about is the rate at which the reaction occurs. And in order for us to look at the rate, we're going to need to look at the kinetics process. So some spontaneous processes occur very fast, like an explosion. Some spontaneous processes are extremely slow, such as a, a diamond compo uh, transitioning to graphite over time. This process might take millions of years, even though it's spontaneous. And so for the next segment, we're going to look at the different factors that affect the kinetics or the rate of a reaction occurring. So just to summarize, all of the thermodynamic properties that we just looked at are going to tell us information about whether a reaction will occur or not. Is the reaction spontaneous? And the variables that we're going to look at now are going to tell us at what rate the reaction will occur. The reaction rate is a function of the number of molecular collisions that will occur in a given period of time. And the factors that are going to affect this is the concentration of the reactants, right? The more reactants that we have in a smaller amount of space, then the more molecular collisions we'll have. The activation energy of the reaction occurring, the temperature of the reaction vessel will increase the vibrations and the the movement of the molecules, which will increase the number of collisions. The geometry and the sterics of each individual molecule will determine how accessible the specific atoms that we're looking at to react with each other are. And then the presence of a catalyst might lower any activation barriers for the reaction to occur. We can use the rate law to help us study the rate of a reaction. So the rate law is going to be equal to a constant, a rate constant for a specific reaction, multiplied by the concentration of the starting materials. So depending on the rate constant and the concentration will have a, an effect on the rate of the reaction. And the degree to which this change occurs for the concentration of the reactants is known as the order. So a first order reaction is going to depend on only the concentration of A. If A is doubled, then the rate will double. If we have two of the reactant concentrations that play an effect on the rate, then this would be a second order reaction. The same relationship will occur between the concentration of A and the rate. If A is doubled, then the rate is also doubled. And a third order reaction will be if we have an exponential variable on the concentration of A. And then if we double the concentration, then we'll quadruple the rate. So when we look at a reaction coordinate diagram, in this case, we're going to have the potential energy on the y-axis. The activation energy is going to be the energy that is required for the reactants to receive in order to overcome this barrier to, to move to the products. This is the minimum amount of energy required for the molecular collisions to occur, resulting in a reaction. As the activation energy increases, the number of molecules that have enough energy to react will decrease.
So if we compare these two reactions, in both cases, the energy of our reactants and our products are going to stay the same. What's changing between these two reactions is the amount of activation energy that is required for the reaction to occur. So a reaction that has a lower amount of activation energy is going to occur at a faster rate than a reaction with a, low, with a higher amount of activation energy required. Temperature will increase the rate of a reaction. So at a higher temperature, molecules will have more kinetic energy and more molecules will have, will have crossed the threshold to reach that activation barrier. If we have a bulky molecule, it, there's going to be less opportunity for the orbitals to overlap that are necessary for a reaction to occur. So when, a mo when the molecules collide, they're going to need to have the correct orientation of those orbitals to form and break bonds. If the molecule has too much steric bulk around the site where a reaction would occur, then it'll be less likely for those orbitals to overlap. A catalyst is going to speed up the rate of the reaction without being consumed. And notice we have two reactions here. In both cases, the reactants and the products are at the same relative energy. But with the catalyst, the activation barrier is much lower. So we can have more of the reactants having enough energy to overcome this activation barrier. So a catalyst is going to lower the activation energy for a reaction. They're not consumed, so we should be able to use the catalyst in over and over again. You don't need to have a stoichiometric or one-to-one -one molar amount of them. And they'll provide a faster and alternative pathway for the reaction to occur. So if we wanted to summarize in one figure the difference between kinetics and thermodynamics, in both of these figures, we have potential energy as our y-axis. And potential energy is the variable we want to use for all of our reaction coordinate diagrams. Because with the potential energy, we can relate both kinetics and thermodynamics to each other. Kinetics, we're looking at the rate of the reaction, so we're looking at the activation energy required for the reactants to overcome this barrier. And whereas thermodynamics, we're looking at the difference, the, the change in Gibbs free energy between the reactants and the products. Let's compare these two reactions. We have A and B, and there's two pathways which they can go to. They can go to C or D and E and F. In this case, products C and D are going to form faster than E and F because the activation energy is lower for this to occur. So it'll occur faster, and the products for C and D are more stable than E and F because they're lower in energy. Let's compare that to this case. Here we have two different energies of our products. In this case, C and D is more stable than E and F. But if we look at the activation barrier, to get to E and F is going to require much less energy. So E and F will form faster, but C and D are the more stable products. When we're looking at a potential energy diagram or a reaction coordinate diagram, there's a few local minimum and maximum that we want to be aware of. Whenever we have a local maximum of energy, these are going to be transition states between a starting material, for example, and an intermediate. When we reach a low energy point in the reaction coordinate diagram, we're at an intermediate. A transition state is not going to be a molecule that we would be able to isolate, for example. We can isolate an intermediate. We're forming a new molecule when we reach to an intermediate. But transition states can't be observed or isolated in any way. These are a high energy state that a reaction passes through. 
For example, in this reaction, we're breaking a carbon-chlorine bond and we're forming a new carbon-bromine bond simultaneously. So the transition state is going to have a partial bond being broken and formed at the same time. The transition states are going to be our energy maxima on the potential energy diagrams. An intermediate is going to be an observable and in sometimes isolatable inter uh, structure that will occur during a reaction. So for example, in this reaction, we break a bromine carbon bond at this transition state, and then we'll form this carbocation intermediate between the two transition states. One more part of the reaction must occur, forming a carbon-chlorine bond before we can get to the product, and this is going to require a second activation energy. If we have two points on the potential energy diagram that are close to each other in energy, their structures will be relatively similar at this point. So this is the, this is the reaction that we looked at on the previ previous slide, two slides ago. The transition state, remember, is when this bond is being broken and formed at the same time. Um, and if we're a little bit further down the energy hill, we could see that now the bromine-chlorine bond is longer and the carbon-chlorine bond is becoming shorter. So this is going to be more similar to the products than it would be to the reactants because it's, clo it's closer to the products on the... Re In an exothermic reaction, the transition state is going to resemble the reactants because they're closer in energy. So the transition state will be more similar to the reactants. In an endothermic process where the products are higher in energy than the reactants, the transition state will resemble the products more closely. A polar reaction involves ions as the reactants, intermediates, and or products. And so we'll generally have some sort of charge involved. Let's take a look at uh, methyl chloride, for example. We have carbon chlorine bond. We have electronegativity difference between the carbon and the chlorine, which means that we have a dipole moment and a partial positive charge on the carbon. If we look at the energy diagram of that, you can see in red we have more electron density than the blue atoms. Blue signifies a more positive type charge. In methyl lithium, we have the exact opposite dipole moment, and therefore we have a more negative like carbon. The carbon has more of this orange color. So an electrophile is going to be a species that loves electrons. This carbon with the partial positive will act like a carbon electrophile because it is more positively charged. And in this case, we have a carbon that is that is going to be a partial negative, and that's going to be more nucleophilic because it has a buildup of the negative charge. A nucleophile is going to be an electron-rich species. We we're going to have the ability to donate electrons, um, generally through a lone pair or through a pi bond. Those electrons will be nucleophilic. The more polarizable the, the two atoms in a pi bond, for example, then the, the stronger a nucleophile we will have. Electrons are electron, uh, electrophiles are electron deficient species, so think positive charge, and they can accept a pair of electrons. So our electrophiles will always be Lewis acids or carbocations or any atom that has a partial positive charge on them. So for practice, you can take a look at this molecule and try to identify all of the nucleophilic and electrophilic sites on the molecule. We use curved arrows to show how electrons move to form or break bonds. And so we, we use these with acid-base reactions. Acid-base reactions are examples of nucleophilic, electrophilic couplings. If we have a base, we start with the curved arrow on the lone pair. Uh, 
and that arrow head is going to point at the electrophile or the empty orbital where the electrons will move into. So in an acid-base reaction, we have two sets of arrows, one designating the bond being formed between the base and the proton, and then a second arrow indicating the, bond, the electrons of the bond between the acid and the proton moving to the acid. There's four general patterns that you guys should be aware of and pay attention to uh, when we're looking at polar reactions. The first is nucleophilic attack. The second is going to be loss of a leaving group, so those two arrows are signified here. Actually, these, this reaction could be summarized as a proton transfer as well. So if we have um, a base removing a proton, that's a proton transfer. It looks very similar to the arrows of a nucleophilic attack and a leaving group. And then the final would be a rearrangement. So in a nucleophilic attack, we're going to have a nucleophile or something that has a negative charge, a lone pair, um, or a pi bond attacking an electrophile. So we're forming a new bond between the lone pair on this bromine and the empty p orbital of the carbocation. The tail of the arrow is going to start on the electrons with the negative charge, and the head of the arrow is going to end up on the nucleus of the atom that has a positive or partial positive charge on it. The electrons for this bond end up being shared to form a new bromine carbon bond. In some cases, a nucleophilic attack may require more than one curved arrow. So here we have an oxygen nucleophile forming a new bond with a carbonyl group. Remember, a carbonyl group, we have a partial negative on the oxygen and a partial positive on the carbon due to the electronegativity difference between the two. Also, we have a resonance structure for all carbonyls that can put a positive charge on the carbon. So we could draw out this reaction either way. We could draw it out with a nucleophilic attack or we could use a resonance structure that involves the positive charge on the carbon and a nucleophilic attack at that point. Pi bonds can also act as nucleophiles. So here we have a, the pi bond forming a new bond with the sulfur and a sulfur oxygen pi bond breaking. A leaving group is going to be a group that can leave the molecule. Uh, often there's a, an electronegativity and size difference between a good leaving group and the, the molecule that it's leaving. A good leaving group will be fairly stable in solution on its own, so our halogens are often good leaving groups, especially with the poor overlap of the uh, atomic orbitals since the halogens can be so large. In a, in a leaving group loss, it's going to be a heterolytic bond cleavage. So we're going to have the two electrons both moving to the leaving group. There's many examples where it actually takes multiple arrows to eject the leaving group. So looking at this structure down here, we have the oxygen pushing electrons down towards the nitrogen, and this cascade of electrons eventually ejects the chlorine as a leaving group. A proton transfer is going to be a Lewis acid Lewis base reaction, or a, sorry, a Bronsted acid Bronsted base reaction. And for a proton transfer to occur, we're always going to have hydrogen acting as an empty shell with no electrons around it. So here we have the lone pair on the oxygen forming a new bond with the proton um, and ejecting water as the leaving group. We can also have a deprotonation event. This is just the reverse equilibrium of this first event where water removes the proton from the ketone. Sometimes we're going to need multiple arrows to show the complete exchange of electrons when a proton transfer occurs. For example, the proton directly next to a ketone is fairly acidic because of this partial positive charge. So we can have a hydroxide group deprotonate, then the electrons from the proton carbon bond form a new pi bond, which requires these, these pi bond to break and the electrons to move up to an oxygen. And you can think about these proton transfers in conjunction with their potential resonance.
Finally, we'll talk about rearrangements. So rearrangements occur uh, for carbocations so that we can form a more stable carbocation. Remember, a carbocation is going to have an empty p orbital. So this is going to be not a very happy carbon. It wants to have its full p orbital, uh, its full octet. It wants electrons in that orbital. And so the more carbons that are next door, so this carbocation has a methyl group next door, there's electrons between these carbon-hydrogen bonds that help to stabilize the empty p orbitals. And this effect is called hyperconjugation, this overlap between the carbon-hydrogen bonds that, occur, that contain electrons overlapping with the empty p orbital is going to help to stabilize that empty p orbital. So the more carbons that we have around a carbocation, the more stable carbocation we're going to have. A tertiary carbocation is the most stable carbocation, um, followed by a secondary, followed by a primary, and a methyl carbocation is extremely unstable because we have no carbons around it. There's two main types of carbocation rearrangements that we'll see. For carbocation rearrangements, you always want to look at the carbon that the carbocation's on and figure out if there's a more substituted carbon next door. So in this case, we have a tertiary carbon over here. So a 1,2 hydride shift, the electrons between the carbon and hydrogen are going to move over here to form a new carbon-hydrogen bond. And that results in the carbocation forming on the more substituted carbon. In this case, we have a quaternary carbon next door. So there's no hydride attached, no hydrogen attached to do a shift. So instead, we have a methyl shift occur, a 1,2 methide shift. Shifts can only occur from the adjacent carbon. And shifts only occur if a more stable carbocation uh, results. So in a multi-step reaction, we can kind of combine all four of these. Let's take a look at this reaction. We start out with an alcohol. This alcohol can act as a loose base and undergo a proton transfer, so an acid-base reaction, to form a protonated oxygen. This is now a good leaving group because water is a very stable molecule. So we can break the carbon-oxygen bond with a heterolytic bond cleavage. Those electrons go to the oxygen to form a molecule of water. And now we have a secondary carbocation as a result. If we analyze the second car secondary carbocation, we notice next door there's a quaternary carbocation. And so we'll have a 1,2 methide shift to form a tertiary carbocation, which is more stable than the secondary carbocation. This tertiary carbocation can finally be trapped with the nucleophilic bromine that has eight electrons and a negative charge to form a new carbon-bromine bond in the, in the product. A little review on drawing the curved arrows. A curved arrow is always going to start on a pair of electrons and end on an atom. Or and on a bond. So in this case, we are going to start with the lone pair on the oxygen and end on the carbon atom. Since we're forming a new bond with this carbon atom, we're also going to be breaking a bond to the carbon atom from this chlorine atom, which is a good leaving group. Notice where this second arrow starts. It starts on the bond between the carbon and the chlorine. This is drawn incorrectly. This would show the electrons coming from the carbon going to the chlorine, but there it's actually the electrons that are shared between the carbon and the chlorine that are moving to that chlorine. The head of the curved arrow is either going to show the formation of a bond or the formation of a lone pair. So in this first arrow, we're, we're ending the arrow at an atom that's showing the formation of a bond because the electrons are going from one atom to another atom. Here, the electrons actually start as a bond, so we're going to be forming a lone pair with this specific atom. Any curved arrow that you draw is going to be describing one of the four patterns that we've shown. Whenever we observe a carbocation, we're going to want to first analyze it to see if it can rearrange. A rearrangement will always occur faster 
then a new reaction would occur. So for example, we notice this carbocation is on a secondary carbon. We look next door here, that's also a secondary carbon. There won't be any carbocation rearrangement in that direction. But if we look over here, we have a tertiary carbon with a hydrogen attached. So a carbocation rearrangement would occur to move the carbocation to this position. In general, tertiary carbocations won't rearrange because they're fairly stable. There are a couple examples where there are carbocations that are more stable than a tertiary carbocations, and one of those will be an allylic carbocation. So here we have a tertiary carbon with a carbocation next door. A hydride shift could occur to move the carbocation to this position. And this is actually a more stable position for our carbocation because this Low, this pi bond that it's conjugated with, that's next door, can engage in resonance to stabilize the carbocation over two different atoms. So allylic carbocation is going to be more stable than a tertiary carbocation. Now let's take a look at the arrows between two structures. So when we have an equilibrium arrow, that signifies that the reaction can go in both the forward and the reverse direction, this would be used for a reversible, um, a reversible reaction or reversible electron movement. And a acid-base reaction or a proton transfer is almost always going to be reversible. Forming a new carbon-carbon bond, however, is, is going to be an irreversible reaction. So we'll use a one-directional arrow. The question of whether we use a reversible arrow versus an irreversible arrow is going to be both a kinetic and a thermodynamic question. If we have a uh, the nucleophile attacking, acting also as a good leaving group, then we can have a reversible reaction. So in this case, water we determined is a good leaving group because water is a very stable mo molecule. If we have it acting as a nucleophile for a carbocation, this would be an example of a reversible reaction because we can also break this carbon-oxygen bond heterolytically since we have a good leaving group. If the nucleophile is a poor leaving group, it will be an irre irreversible reaction. So methyl, methyl anion, is a good nucleophile Right? It wants to, it wants to um, form a new bond. It does not like having the negative formal charge on it. But once it's formed, there's no process where the methyl group acts as a leaving group because it's a bad leaving group. So there will be only a single-headed arrow since there is no reverse action that can occur. The loss of a leaving group is almost always reversible because most leaving groups are also good nucleophiles. Any proton transfer is going to be reversible. If the pKa difference is greater than 10 between two acid-base pairs, then that can be considered an irreversible reaction. And that's it's still an equilibrium, but with the pKa difference of 10, the equilibrium is shifted so far in one direction that we can just consider it to be irreversible. Carbocation rearrangements are generally going to be irreversible, remember, because a carbocation is never going to rearrange to a, a less stable variant. 